All right, everybody. Hello and welcome. I have Caitlin V on the podcast today. The amazing and insightful Caitlin V. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I appreciate this. Thank you so much for having me. I really, and for those who don't know, you are just kind of give up everybody a quick description of what you do and your expertise. I'm a sex and relationship coach and my particular area of expertise is men's intimacy, sexuality, romantic lives, uh, and personal growth. Yeah. And us men need all the help we can get. <laughs> Definitely. And they, de we need it from for coming from men and women, right? We've both got a lot to say from very mm -hmm. different perspectives around, you know, how men can achieve what they're here to achieve and have the kinds of love and sex life that they deserve. Absolutely. Um, and let me ask you, how did you get into this field? Was this something as a topic you were always interested in as a young adult? Or yeah, I knew I was going to do sex as my career. Like even before I had sex, I, I, I was just one of those kids that, that geeked out on a subject and mm -hmm. knew that this is what I was going to do with my life. I put like sexologist as my major on Facebook back when you had to join Facebook with the EDU yeah. email address. <laughs> but even before then, I used to have my dad drop me off at the bookstore because they don't have sex books at the library for the most oh. part. I'd have him oh. drop me off at the bookstore and I would like nerd out, geek out on sex and techniques, not the erotica, not the fiction stuff, the like real how-to stuff. It just fascinated me. And I mm -hmm. went into science first because I thought, well, I can't really like, I don't know what I thought I was going to do with sex as my career, you know, at like set the tender age of 17. So mm -hmm. I ended up going into empirical science and became a professional sexual health researcher. And wow. then I, it was just, it's too dry for me in academia. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to get back to like actually helping people. And so I, you know, took my many years as an educator, became a coach. I didn't expect I was going to work with men. I thought I'm a woman, I'm a bisexual, queer, cisgender female female person. I figured I was going to work with people like me. And mm -hmm. then I got I asked to do a YouTube video on squirting, which mm -hmm. is one of the internet's favorite subjects. <laughs> the YouTube video took off. And overnight, I had thousands of men who were interested in squirting, who learned about me through that, mm -hmm. and, you know, and tended to have performance anxiety and premature ejaculation because they were kind of looking at squirting as like a, a, a way of sort of compensating for what mm -hmm. they saw as their shortcomings. So I had a line out the door of men who wanted to work with me. And I just said yes, because the opportunity was there. And I, it, it flowed easily. And it brought me a lot of joy. And here we are, like seven years later, I've spent seven years working wow intensely with men in one-on-one -on -one and in group settings and on my YouTube channel. And so I've really developed this like expertise in, in what the modern man uh, mm -hmm. is dealing with. Contemporary oh, yeah. men are dealing with in bed and in their relationships. Yeah. And, you know, coming from a man's standpoint, I really do appreciate that. And I want to ask you, um, I know from my standpoint and other friends that I've had, we want to be givers. We want to really perform well with our partner, wife, girlfriend, whoever that may be. Do you find it's more men who have questions about sex versus women, or is it like an equal type of, uh, I guess, approach to you? Different questions. Okay. okay. I think the, the quality, quantity is the same, and they're just of a different, it's not quality as in like one's better than the other, but like the actual quality, the texture, the fabric, the flavor of the questions is very different. Yeah. As you said, men, it's mostly about giving. It's a lot about performance. How do I make her come? How do I... Uh, you know, uh, 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 impress her? How do I thrust? You mm -hmm. know, they really want the <laughs> techniques, which is really interesting because, uh, you know, techniques have existed since the Kama Sutra. There's techniques and right. positions and, and, you know, obviously that stuff is very useful, but it actually needs to be built on top of a foundation uh, of, of relating and being in your body and breathing. And we can talk all about that. For yes. women, their questions are less performance based than they tend to revolve around, like, how do I reach orgasm consistently, reliably? How do I make it so that sex doesn't hurt? How do I give my partner feedback so that he knows what's working for me, but without like hurting his ego? Women mm -hmm. want to increase their libido. Men want to increase women's libido. That's very common. But on both sides, and this is interesting because this isn't the way that we typically think about things. On both sides, there are libido mismatches. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of women out there who are like, how do I get my husband, my partner, my boyfriend to have sex with me? Just as many, I think. Think, uh, uh, maybe it's not an equal amount, but the pain is the same mm -hmm. as there are men who are like, how do I get my wife to sleep with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, I was, if you don't know, I was married 16 years uh, with the same woman for 20. And I do recall sex being a major uh, proponent of like why we divorced and along with others, that was just one fraction, not mm -hmm. the main component. But as far as what, for me, and I think a lot of men fall into this is that we get, I got married young at 21. And I only had one partner before my, my high school sweetheart. So I only slept with two people at the age of 21, mm -hmm. got married, and we were together for so long. For us guys who get married young and have no experience, we learn through pornography. 
And we thought, this is how stupid I was, I thought that that's what women liked. I thought what you saw on television, on movies is what women love. So I, I remember forming my, my approach to that. And when she didn't like it, I remember she would tell me, little, this is like in my early 20s. She's like, hey, try this instead. I remember getting very defensive. And, I, and uh, with, my, with my demographic now, there's a lot of women that follow me who says, I, how do I talk to my husband? If I just tell him, you know, stop, I'm not a PlayStation controller down there. You just kind of calm down. <laughs> yes, don't do that. Why are no you spitting? No mashing. Yeah, like how do you, how, do, how would you advise or what advice would you give a woman to kind of talk to their, their spouse or boyfriend? Like, hey, let, that doesn't work for me. Let's try something else. Yeah, that is a million dollar question, Rudy. I know. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of it has to do with how safe the communication and how quality the communication in your relationship is outside of the bedroom. Because if mm -hmm. it's not quality communication, the harder the subject is to discuss, you know, death, yeah. money, sex, family, mm -hmm. who we're spending Christmas with this year or whatever, like these subjects can already be very fraught. So, you know, the real question is, do you have safety inside of your communication to even begin with? Do you feel mm. safe to express your needs, wants, desires? And do, are you a safe space, men and women, are you a safe space to receive your partner's need, wants, desires? Because so yeah. many of us are actually not. We think that we are, we're not. Right? Very true. Like you said, we become defensive when we when we hear mm -hmm. that. We're not able to just say, hey, I got your communication. I heard what you said without mm -hmm. even responding. Right? right. So one of the things that my mentor Jaya teaches is the A-B touch game. Um, OK. And it's really simple. Uh, you test two different touches on your partner. So um, you would say, OK, so say we're just talking about face stroking. So I can give you a demo. Like here's like back of the hand, slow fingertip face touch. That's gotcha. touch A. And then maybe touch B is like whole hand, full contact stroke. And I would just say, like, do you like touch A more? Or do you like to touch B more? Therefore, there's no, do you like it faster, harder, softer, scratchier, rougher? You know, we have, yeah. we, we struggle so much to come up with the exact language of what it is that we want. But usually we can say, I like this one more than the other. Or here's what I didn't like about that. Mm -hmm. Right. So th the reason I give you this one example is that if you can give this to your partner, if you can show this to them, if you can bring that into your bedroom, you know, women, if you can say this to him, like, hey, do you like when I scratch your back like this or do you like when I scratch your back like this? Mm -hmm. Which one do you like more? What is it that you maybe what is it that you like about that? Oh. You can start to have a conversation that's not about you did something wrong. I want it different. That doesn't work for me. Right. Where that really pulls on people's um, it, it, it pulls up our defenses. Right. It does. When, when the sentence starts with like you aren't doing it right, we're automatically on a defensive position. Right. Mm -hmm. But if instead it's like, hey, I'd like to explore some new touches and kind of see, you know, where we're at today, because even if we've known each other for 10 years, this is the body I got today. The yeah. body I have today doesn't like the same stuff as when I met my husband. Mm -hmm. You know, she's changed. Yeah, she's absolutely. older, yeah. you know, yeah. she's, she's wiser <laughs> too. So, you know, we introducing little things along those lines that create safety inside of the communication. And then you can build from there, uh, just like one step at a time. That is, I'm smiling cause that's amazing advice. <laughs> that's a wonderful way to introduce something different into the bedroom. And again, my demographic is really uh, 50, 50 over like uh, women and women, all ages, but I do get a lot of questions from women and men, and we'll get to the, the, the men in a bit, but when it comes to women, let's say um, they have a dead bedroom situation and their husband doesn't want to touch them. And, you know, for the newlyweds, it's not really that type of like, uh, I guess, situation I'm hearing more commonly about. It's more the 10 to 15 year. And they've written me like I'm talking like five page letters saying they've tried everything. They've done everything sexually that you could possibly can do. They're just they're just bored. And she goes, what can I do to save it before I, cause I get the feeling he's going to leave. So what can I do to save that situation? Like what advice would you have for those uh, wives or women? Well, let me get that. These are women who are experiencing that they want to have sex more than their husband or their partner. Right. Mm -hmm. He's not interested maybe in having sex with her. And she's None. like, I've tried everything that I can think of that I know to try. Right. And I still can't get him interested in having intimacy with me. And it's just, I've reached a breaking point. I'm ready to go. Yeah. Well, people do not want to hear this. This is going to be the hottest take on this podcast, I think. But mm -hmm. I think that you, you know, when you have maybe kids and you have a life and you have a vision for your retirement and you have built something together, I think go have sex outside of your marriage. 
So oh. many people are like, absolutely not, would never, could never, we're in it together, or that's it. And what I say to that is, look, you have a companionate marriage. Get over yourself. You have a companionate marriage. This person is your best friend. You mm -hmm. raised family together. You have your retirement plans and your friends, and you're going to blow all of that up because you think that this person should also be giving you sex. Have yeah. sex outside of your marriage. Create it with your spouse. Yes, it's going to take time. It's going to people's feelings are going to get hurt. Y'all are going to need coaching. You might need some therapy. But consider that maybe this person isn't meant to be your sexual partner. Maybe they're meant to be your life partner, and you go just go have sex with somebody else. Wow, I, actually, that blows my mind. That is a hot take. <laughs> so let me ask you this. So. Is that like a swinging, like, are you saying like introduce maybe going into the swinging lifestyle? I mean, there's a lot of different ways that consent. So the, the umbrella term is consensual non-monogamy. CNM is what you'll often see it abbreviated as. And okay. it, that is it. Consensual non-monogamy. Everyone is consenting, including whoever it is that you're having sex with. Mm -hmm. You, your husband, your, your spouse, everyone's on above board and they've had some degree of consent and say, it doesn't mean that, you know, swinging is one option. Swinging tends to take place with couples. Usually swinging is between yes. couples. Mm -hmm. Single women are welcome everywhere though. They're welcome in swingers clubs. They're welcome in sex clubs. They're welcome in fetish clubs. They're your, trust me as a single woman, you can get in. I'm sorry, single men. It's not always the same for you. Do you not yeah. have the same ease of access? We could talk about sex work. That's kind of where the ease of access is for men, right? Right. Uh, there's not so much for that for women, but you have swinging, you have a polyamory, which is having like emotional and sexual relationships. You may have just an open marriage where you're seeking sexual partnerships, but not ongoing emotional ones. You know, again, this is going to be very triggering for some folks, but I invite Ugly. you to consider that whatever you, vision you came up with, like Rudy, you said swinging, right? Whatever you came up with first in your mind is absolutely not the end all be all. There are you know, millions of people practicing consensual non-monogamy and no two people's CNM looks exactly the same. So if that's mm. something that you want to explore, just know that there's a lot of different ways that it could look and there's a way that it could look for you. Yes. And I can imagine, oh, my, being married at one point, I can only imagine what that conversation would be. Who introduces that com that topic or that option? And how do you talk? I mean, is it, do, do you do it through a professional environment with a uh, maybe a sex therapist, something like that, or a sex coach? Or do you that talk about it? That might be the it? right way to do it. Yeah. As yeah. like a, a safe ground, because I know if a man in most cases were to bring that up, that would just infuriate this, his spouse or vice versa, too, because everyone thinks of the worst possible thing ever. And if, and again, if your if your marriage or is just just covered in insecurities in or maybe what's going to happen, are we going to last? That may, may that may not be the best option. Well, because it may I still just, be the best option, but it's going to mm -hmm. bring up all those insecurities, which if you yeah. look at it from a coaching perspective is giving you an opportunity to heal that stuff that you would never otherwise, you know, because yeah. monogamy gives us an opportunity to pretend like to live in this, this sort of like pretense of, I don't have to face any of those insecurities because right. there's no looking outside of our partnership. Right. But right. Isn't, the insecurity is still there. Mm -hmm. Right. And the minute that you introduce maybe, Hey, we should consider having sex with other people, all those insecurities are going to be like right there at the surface, but it comes mm -hmm. back to safety. Do you have a it safe does. partnership where you can communicate things? And the way that it looks like is the person who's not having sex, the person who's tried everything, who's been trying to seduce and have a spicy bedroom and they, you know, they feel like they've exhausted all their options, goes to the other person and says, hey, sex is really important to me. Mm -hmm. And I have done A, B, and C because I really wanted to have sex with you and, and have sex be a part of our relationship. But after 10 or 15 years, it yeah. seems like that's not the case. And I'm no longer going to um, put off my needs inside mm. of our relationship. But here, let me reassure you that you are my number one. I want to stay married to you. Like, I want I to continue you. to raise our yeah. children together. I love you. There's nothing wrong with you. I think this is a critical part of this communication. There is absolutely nothing wrong with you. I get that you and I'm not even going to tell myself a story. We're not having sex. It's not about you like me. You're attracted to me. You don't like me. You're asexual. You're pieces. Whatever. I, I got the communication from you that you are not available for us to have a sexual relationship mm -hmm. with the frequency and the passion that I'm looking for. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with you. I am going to get this need met and I want to work together in collaboration with you to do that in a way that offers us the most growth and the least amount of pain. Understanding that it's not going to be painless. Of course, and yeah. You take it from there. It, I had a, a friend of mine who, uh, just like me, he's divorced as well, but he had married his high school sweetheart, right? And they, around the 13th, 15th year, they decided to introduce, you know, hey, we're kind of bored in the situation. Let's have a threesome. 
And this is what he told me uh, years after the fact. So they had a threesome. They brought a woman into the bedroom and it, it was okay. And he says, you know what? It's not like you see in the movie. So don't think it's going to be exactly like that. It was actually very uncomfortable, but they kept at it. <laughs> they kept at it. But what happened was, is that his ex-wife and the woman they brought into the bedroom connected emotionally. And she eventually left him for this woman. So I, I think um, I love the idea. Uh, trust me, I, I love the suggestion. I'm like full forward, but I think there's a lot of people out there who maybe don't have the emotional maturity um, to dive in that space because they can possibly develop feelings for somebody they have sex with. And that happens more common than you think. I, I mean, it's true. People, it, some, some women say that men from, like uh, sex to us is just physical. It can be, but it, it, there's a connection that develops over time. You know, you can go into something and say, no, it's just the act. I don't, I'm not going to get connected, but eventually it does. So there's a danger for that happening. Oh. I mean, having sex releases a whole soup of neurotransmitters and chemicals into our body. It causes us to bond with other people, mm -hmm. right? And But here's the thing. In in no relationship is there 100% safety. She may have met that woman at a grocery store, hit it off with her, and decided to pursue a relationship too, right? Like, even though you're monogamous doesn't mean that you don't meet someone and then fall for them. Now, what I would say is that inside of that relationship, what they maybe could have had in place to begin with was... If we fall for this woman, if one of us falls for this woman, is mm -hmm. there space inside of our relationship that we open up and you're able to maintain both? Right. Ah, so that's more okay. of a polyamory dynamic. If these people are both, you know, if, if she's wants to be in a one on one monogamous partnership, even though they're having sex with somebody else, it sounds like she went from one partner to one partner. Mm -hmm. But was there space to maybe keep that partnership going? Was there was that partnership naturally at its end? You know, were they were they meant to go their separate ways either way? And this one was just yeah. a catalyst. You know, there's just I would like to know more about your friend because that mm -hmm. is just like one example. But there are so many examples. And you know what the funny thing about non-monogamy is is that you only really hear the examples of times that it went quote unquote wrong. That's true. Because you, true. I guarantee you, everyone listening, you know more than one person who's a swinger. You know more than one person who's having threesomes, who's a unicorn, who's doing kinky fun stuff that you would be absolutely shocked about because mm -hmm. they don't tell anyone <laughs> the only, and because they don't tell anyone because there's so much, you know, whatever there's, there's so much trigger and there's so much um, prejudice against non-monogamy because mm -hmm. it threatens people in a really deep way. And I totally get that. That's the, the fear is valid. Um, not doing anything about it. Isn't the answer. That's but true. You, you'll hear for every horror story, like your friends, I mean, it's not a horror story, maybe it's all happily ever after, but there's a hundred stories that just never get told because they're just working. Yeah, I, I totally get that. I actually have a friend of mine, an old high school friend, he and his girlfriend of 10, 11 years are swingers. They're in the life is what they call mm -hmm. it. And I had the them on the family. podcast a, a long time ago. Actually, they had to take the show down because of other reasons. But anyway, they, of all the people that I've ever met in my life, the, them too, they have the healthiest relationship I've ever seen in my life. They love each other. They adore each other. They just have this one need. Like you said, it's only physical. There's nothing emotionally attached to it. And they went into in depth because they go as, as somebody who has no idea of what that lifestyle is. You know, you think of all these like movies that pop in your head and it's nothing like that. But their intimacy and the love they have for each other is the strongest I've ever seen with any couple, any relationship that's been 10 years or more. So it's amazing how it can actually thrive in that space. Yeah, because we have a tendency in our culture to flatten sex, monogamy, commitment, mm -hmm. sex, love, commitment, mm -hmm. all one thing. If you're committed to someone, you're having sex with them and you love them. If you love someone, you're also willing to have sex and commit to them. It, and, but we know in practice that, yes, ideally, that would be so great. Imagine how many awesome marriages there would be if people had sex and love and commitment. It's, yes, I we agree. all want all three of those. I totally and agree. unfortunately, in a lot of relationships, especially like, you know, in both of those instances, someone who's been together for a decade or more, um, if you don't have all three, then you get to ask yourself, do I trash this relationship and find a new one that hopefully has all three, or mm -hmm. do I supplement? And a lot of the time for people who are in non-monogamy, um, you know, swingers in particular, they find that they actually want to have more sex with each other because they're reminded that their partner and themselves are sexual beings. You know, when you see someone else mm. who wants to have sex with your partner, you're suddenly like, oh, you know what? They yeah. are kind of hot. 
I do. <laughs> they, you know, they are pretty sexy. You know, it, it, mm-hmm. it just it can change and revitalize those things. So I think you know we we unfairly discount it very often. But I agree. yeah, I, that's what I would say to those those women who are asking, what do I do? Like, bring up the idea of bringing other people in. You just don't know what your spouse is going to say. I heard, I have a friend who's a sex worker. She said, I remember asking her like a threesome. like, how do you know if it's the right thing to do? She goes, well, Rudy, if, if you, the spouse are telling your spouse about the idea, they don't respond with a, like an overwhelming yes, then don't do it because that's something that they may not be down with. But if they're just enthusiastic about the response or the suggestion, that's the way to go. Yes. And I'll say for myself that there have been some situations where I was a timid yes, which is not to say that I wasn't consenting. It's I'm consenting and I'm like, that feels like it's going to stretch me beyond my limits. Here's Mm -hmm. what I need. Right. And I think this is another piece of this equation is do you have clarity around what your own needs are? Because what I would Mm. say is, okay, in order for me to have a threesome with you and for it to be successful, I need to spend time connecting. I need to have a deep conversation with this person. I need to trust them that they're not trying to like steal my husband. Uh, (laughs) I need to make sure that we have time scheduled afterward. That's just us to reconnect. So, you know, that person's not spending the night with us and that all of that That together, if we can get to alignment and agreement on all that, then I can be an enthusiastic yes. So even if you're, even if you're like, Ooh, I'm a little timid around that, like Mm -hmm. do the deeper work of asking like, okay, what do you, what would you need to be in place for it to be successful? Like project yourself into the end. All three of us are kissing goodbye, saying goodbye for the night. Like what needs to be true for me Mm -hmm. to feel really good about that experience? Yeah. And that's something I've never thought of. That's, that's a very interesting take. I love that. I love that. So let's kind of flip it here. So let's say, uh, for the men, I also get a lot of men who say they love their wife, you know, they're like six years in seven years in, and they're just, they just want to have sex and their spouse is telling them no, or they got a headache or just really using it as a reward. You're not going to get it until you cut the grass, which like, oof, I can't stand. So what advice would you give those, uh, young husbands, uh, who are seven years in, what, what can they do? So first we should talk about the importance of some certain time milestones in relationships. Okay. Two, four, seven, 10, 15, 20. These are the years upon which most breakups and divorces happen. Mm -hmm. Two years is when that big initial rush of chemicals and oxytocin that will just bond two people. You're, you're having sex. You're, you got basically two years of warm feelings towards each other. As long as you're staying sexually active, like all those neurochemicals are just going to keep cooking. Four years is about when it's the first major bump in relationships, uh, breaking up has to do with our biology. Four years is about the right amount of time to meet someone, mate with them and raise a child to the point where they're not so dependent on us that they can't sort of go be raised by the village. Wow. Okay. Okay. This is important. You can look up Helen Fisher's work on, um, um, I guess this is like anthrobiology, but, Mm -hmm. uh, for, so four years, we hit the same around seven because now we ha- we have had a chance to raise two children up to the point where they're not reliant on mom and dad every single day, all day. And like they can go be cared for by the village. Right. Uh-huh. And then I think that the reason that 10 and 15 years are um, I think that they're important psychological milestones more than biological ones. Right. Because mm-hmm. this is how we measure time here is in five and 10 <laughs> and 20 years. So uh-huh. I think there's a lot of people who have. And then, of course, there's a lot of people who just have it in their mind. If this isn't fixed by year 10, if this isn't fixed by year 15, I'm out. So then year Mm -hmm. 15 rolls around and of course it didn't get fixed because if why wait till that year, fix it now. (laughs) Um, So anyway, so I want to say that because at years two, four and seven, your biology is actually working against you. So if you're at seven and you're like, I just need to have sex with anyone else, just know that's your biology. You evolved. We have hundreds of thousands of years where we evolved to have multiple mates and remix our DNA frequently because people live to be like 26 and you were, you know, we, there was no written or communicate, like, you know, it was a different time, mm-hmm. very different time. <laughs> Hunters and gatherers, very different. Yes. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about that first. So, so you, but you find yourself, you're a man at about six or seven years in your relationship. Now I think for the majority of men out there, and you're going to be like this, she gave very different advice to men and women. That is true. If you are really good at sex, and you are really, really good. And I do when I, when I when I say good at sex, do not think I'm packing like a porn star. Don't okay. think that. Okay. When I say good at sex, I have a very different definition of what sex is than what you might be thinking. I'm not talking about intercourse. I'm talking about from A to Z. Are you touching, caressing? How good are you with your hands? How good are you with your mouth? Not just at oral sex, but at kissing. Are you keeping, there's this like simmer going on in your relationship where you're, you're providing a space for pleasure that's not 
penis centric and isn't intercourse reliant, right? Are you yes. doing all of that? <laughs> if you're doing all of that, you're not going to have a problem for the most part where she doesn't want to have sex with you. The reason that she doesn't want to have sex with you, the reason that she's got a headache is because it's not fun for her. Get this through your head. If it was fun for her, she'd want to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not fun for her and therefore she doesn't want to do it. Trust me. I love ice cream. Okay. You don't have to really convince me to eat ice cream. Okay. You can wake me up at two in the morning and say, do you want to get some ice cream? Like, yes, I do because ice cream is fun for me and I love it. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you like want to wake me up at 2 a.m. to eat, you know, like baked potatoes, that's the, the, it's not. Yeah. I'm not as seduced, <laughs> right? So quit offering her baked potatoes and start offering her ice cream instead. You're not going to have too much of an issue convincing her because mm -hmm. she's going to be hounding you for sex. And this is my favorite thing about being a coach for men is that so many of the guys come to work with me are like, I just got to learn the right technique. I just, and I'm like, you know what? Actually, what you got to do is learn how to read your wife's body so that you can provide exactly the kind of pleasure yes. that she needs moment to moment basis. And pretty soon they're like, Kaylin, she will not stop asking me. She wants me to do stuff to her all the time. Like I got to get work done. We mm -hmm. got to, we got to like, you know, I got to pay these bills, but all my wife wants is for me to be having sex with her. And I'm like, That's well, amazing. you're welcome. Good for you him. Know, remember six months ago <laughs> when this is all you wanted? You're well, now we got it. Now let's yeah. talk about how to create some balance in there. That's awesome. That's awesome. So again, I, I was married my, uh, myself and I remember my particular situation was again, I learned the wrong way. So what I thought was great wasn't great for her. And like I said, anytime she suggested something, I would go and just get defensive. Like, what do you mean? You know, and like, like this insecurity, like I was, but a lot of men are telling me they do that, but there's also the equation where she just had a baby three years ago, four years ago. She doesn't have the body that she had w before and she doesn't have that confidence uh, she just wants to lay down, not do anything. She just doesn't feel sexy anymore. And she's always tired. And I'm like, well, are you helping out? He goes, well, of course I am. I'm helping out. I mean, it's 50, 50, you know, we both work and I'm contributing. So I'm not just letting her do everything, but she's always tired. So, and I guess I, I don't know if that would be a question for you, but like, what would you advise for a man who's living with a wife who is just gained weight since the baby and she doesn't feel sexy, no confidence. And, uh, again, she's just always tired. So those are sort of three different areas. Okay. Um, let's start with always tired because mm -hmm. I think even women who don't have children and women who have had two or three and they're adults now, children still understand the experience of always tired, right? Yeah. So we have a tendency, I think, to to get ourselves in such a routine yes. that there's no new exciting thing that's happening in our lives, in our personal lives, in our romantic lives. You ever have that experience, like I'm you know, tired and then you're on vacation and suddenly you have all this energy to go do everything and you, you know, want to pack the day, mm -hmm. and to, right? Or like maybe you're the kind of person that just wants to like lay on the beach. But either way, you have a very different experience of yourself, right? Right. right. Like part of that is because of novelty. So one of the things that people tend to lose out on in their long-term romantic partnerships is novelty, newness, expansion, trying new things. And it doesn't have to be an expensive vacation or a new restaurant. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, people, when they hear novelty and sex, they kind of hear like sex toys or new positions or something like that. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be um, as complicated as you may initially think. It can be just taking a lesson together, go, like learning line dancing, mm -hmm. um, going to a, you know, a, 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 a new uh, a restaurant or a theater or a play or uh, mm -hmm. touching each other in a different way. I mean, my God, once you start to like crack open what's possible under the heading of like sex and not just genital intercourse, you will see that there is a never ending like rabbit hole made out of fractals of things that you can yeah. try would and that, that are absolutely be, free. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Would go that ahead. also be intimacy yeah. as well? Okay. Yeah. One of the same. Okay. Go ahead. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, I think yeah, you make a good point. Cause when I say sex, a lot of people do think genitals. Yes. But I'm thinking, you know what I'm, I'm talking about stuff that you wouldn't do with other people unless you had consent. 
it, to me, is sex. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like, Definitely. maybe your genitals didn't touch, but like you took a bath, <laughs> you took a rose petal bath together. Mm-hmm. It's kind of sex, isn't it? You know, yeah. you'd be surprised if your spouse did that without your consent with somebody else. Oh, yeah. I right. wouldn't be too happy it counts about that. sex, but yes, int- intimacy. <laughs> so part of it is just like novelty, because again, the brain just doesn't respond to the same mold by uh, by by offering energy and excitement. You mm-hmm. know, so many of us are, we've conditioned our bodies, especially if we're not physically well. Think about what happens when you're not really taking care of your body. And this is not to point fingers at somebody, but uh, at anybody, but like you're eating processed foods, you're staring at screens, you know, you're, you're not getting enough sleep, you're not getting right. enough exercise, you're not getting enough greens. Your body begins to just go, well, I guess this is kind of it. Mm-hmm. It does not, your DNA does not want to replicate itself unless you are healthy and happy and satisfied. And guess what? In order for your DNA to replicate itself, you need to be sexually active. So if your body is basically, for lack of a better word, dying because you're feeding it processed food and a, you know an ongoing sedentary lifestyle and lots of screen time, yes. what, what urge does your body have to have sex and to procreate? Because it's basically just surviving. Until that's, it, you know, until its last breath, until it, you know, until it runs out. Yeah, that's a great point, and it's. I guess it's really for that person to be aware of that, acknowledge that there is a problem, and make the change. Because we both know that we, we as a spouse or a partner, can't make them change. We can tell them, right. please do, but until they have that, that fire that's lit, or that come to Jesus moment, then they won't. So that's. Right. I, I, I I do recognize that, but it's tough to get someone to change when oh, they're stuck in that rut. Let's change it. Let's do it ourselves. Because, you know, nothing worse than a spouse being like, hey, oh. you should, you know, you <laughs> yeah. ought to eat better. It's like, well, OK, or what about you? Mm-hmm. Right. Don't don't tell your spouse anything that you're not willing to do yourself. But, you know, think back to when you motivated each other to be the best possible version of yourself. Right. Yes. Like what do you you know, it's not enough to just be 50 percent of the chores. Are you also offering to go on walks together? Are you are you offering to cook healthy food instead of processed food? You know, like, are you, it comes down to, are you alive together? Right. Because if you want to have a a, a happy, abundant, pleasurable, intimate sexual relationship that requires for both of your bodies to feel vibrant and alive and feeling uh, exhausted from, having children and feeling overweight and feeling unsexy, like you don't need to lose 10 or 20 pounds to feel alive, right? right? You Mm -hmm. need to just like move a little bit and eat, you know, stuff that grew up in the sun (laughs) and like your, your body will start, but no one really wants to hear this, right? Like that, that's, you know, no no one, no, myself included. I would, are you (laughs) kidding? Like that's, I would just take the pink pill if they had the female Viagra, like, you know, there's a reason they haven't been able to create that. Right. So, so female sexual desire is so much tied to life. It's so much tied to novelty and newness and excitement. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and then of course there's also like there's actual health to look at, right? Um, from a perspective of uh, why, you know, are there things that we're short on? Are there ways that we're deficient in vitamins and minerals? Are we fatigued? Are, are, are adrenals are exhausted? Have we just, um, you know, <laughs> are we just running on adrenaline and yeah. cortisol all day? You know, what's our stress level like? Again, it's it's the most basic stuff, but it's also the hardest stuff to to contend with. Yeah. And, and coming from a, a guy's standpoint, again, uh, it's uh, being a young man at one point, because I'm 45 now. So everything you're saying makes sense, but I'm trying to talk to my 25 year old brain. And I see the conversations that men leave on my comments, which is incredibly naive and idiotic. But I do see a lot of men, the mindset is like, as you said, sex, intimacy, like do other things. There's other things you can do uh, with your partner that are not just penetrating. And I think a lot of young men don't understand that because of what they watch and who they look up to. Uh, They celebrate pornography. They celebrate porn stars. They celebrate uh, OnlyFans models. They celebrate uh, like these Twitch stars that are half naked. They celebrate sexuality, but then they complain that there's no good women out there. So it's like, what do you want, dude? Like, come on. Like, what are you celebrating this? But then you want this. Maybe you should celebrate the traditional woman that you're asking for. But I guess what I'm going with is that when it comes to young men thinking there's other ways to be sexual, sexually intimate with their partner is just non-existent because it won't, they won't know any better because it's just not out there. And when it's there, I know a lot of them will probably say, well, does she doesn't want to have sex with me. Am I not big enough? If I, am I not satisfying enough? Is she seeing somebody else? That's how some guys think. 
And it is just sad. It is just incredibly sad. Right. Instead of asking, like, is it maybe that I'm over relying on the same old tricks that I was using when we first got together mm -hmm. of my fingers, mouth, penis? Mm -hmm. Like, maybe she needs something a little bit different today. And maybe yeah. I haven't taken the time to figure out what that is because it's mm -hmm. very threatening to me. And so, yeah, I go straight to, am I too small? You know, I go straight to thrusting techniques. Again, it's, you know, it's not to shame anyone. Like, you're right. There's no better model for this. People are not taught better. One of the uh, quote that I love is like, sex models the erotic, but it doesn't exhaust it. So eroticism and sexuality are two very different things. Eroticism is like the, 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 like the life force that yeah. moves through us and sex is a part of it, but it's not all of it. But unfortunately, most of us have put all of our, uh, all of our erotic eggs, so to speak, mm. in the basket of sex and sexuality. It's the only place that we really get to experience this like beautiful, spiritual, pleasurable movement of two beings into one and then back to two again. But mm -hmm. there are plenty of places if you are allowing yourself to find them that you can find that eroticism that like a partner dancing. You know, partner yeah. dancing can be erotic without being sexual. I agree. Watching a sunset can be eating a great piece of uh, d dessert can be erotic without being sexual. There's mm -hmm. a lot of difference. If we begin to like kind of pry open what brings us pleasure and we start to explore pleasure together instead of just penetration, mm -hmm. we will continue to sort of like chip away at what that actually looks like. And pretty soon you'll find yourself, you know, uh, uh, with just completely inundated. You're, you're in like the Narnia of pleasure, but you have to like go, go, through the, go through the wardrobe. I love that reference. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so let me ask you this. So there's a lot of young men who want to be the best, the best lover they could possibly be for their girlfriend or spouse. So what would you and tell, what you books? For that. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Narnia rocks anyway. So anyway, uh, like what materials, what books, what would you tell young men to look into to be the best lover for their woman? Let's uh, start with yourself, honestly. Start with the way that you masturbate, mm -hmm. number one. The way you masturbate? Yep. Oh, please continue. Yep. What do you mean? I because, need to know this. <laughs> so the way that you have sex with yourself, right, is pretty indicative of how you're going to have sex with somebody else. So with my clients and my one-on-one -on -one clients, I always start by saying, talk to me about your self-pleasure practice. And mm -hmm. often it's like, mm, you know, I only do it when I'm not getting laid uh, or my wife isn't available. And usually I just, you know, squeeze one out pretty quickly, maybe in the shower in the morning before the kids get up or I love you're nodding. Um, or yeah. maybe, maybe to like porn late at night after everybody's gone to bed, you know, or maybe mm -hmm. on my cell phone in the bathroom, you know, yeah. like w w if we are not prioritizing our own self pleasure and then we are expecting that when we get into bed with another person that we're going to be able to perform for them, we're practicing one way and expecting ourselves to perform another, right? If you uh -huh. were a world star athlete, you would be practicing the same way that you're expecting to go out and play on the field, right? Very true, yeah. And if you were a chef, you'd be making food at home before you served it to other people to make sure that it tasted good, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it is the exact same. But what happens is that a lot of guys do this, like, <laughs> kind of, like, quick and dirty and shame-based masturbation, and then they yeah. expect, when they get into bed with a woman, that it's going to be completely different. They're going to perform mm -hmm. completely differently, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's just like, they can't, you know, so, so start at home. Start at home. Make love to yourself, in a way that someone would appreciate or you would want someone to make love to you or that you would make love to them. This is so difficult for men because they just want to give to somebody else. They do not want to receive. And they certainly do not want to give and receive to themselves. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> if you, so start with you and here's the, here's the other tricks behind that. to like unpack that a little bit further because it sounds like really nice advice and my coach friends would probably unanimously agree, but let me tell you a little bit more about what that actually does. Because when you are actually physically, first of all, coming into contact with yourself in a way that enhances your pleasure. You're going to be able to last longer in bed. You're going to mm -hmm. be able to edge yourself. You'll have more orgasmic control. You'll be able to, if you move slower, you're going to have better orgasms. Mm -hmm. You're also, if you take porn out of the equation, you're going to have less erectile dysfunction. I call this like porn induced ED. It's yeah. not the same as actual medical ED, ED, but guess what? Most of the young, healthy men that are finding that they can't get hard with their female partners don't have any medical issues. They don't have diabetes. They don't have uh, uh, ca uh, cardiac issues, right? Uh -huh. What they have is a lifetime of porn and OnlyFans. And then they wonder why when they're with a normal you know, woman, 
mm-hmm. can't get it hard. Well, yeah, because you're you've been used to watching gangbangs every night for the last seven mm-hmm. years. Like one yeah. one ordinary looking woman is probably not going to do it for you in this instance, right? Mm-hmm. So cut porn out of the equation. Touch yourself for 20, 30 minutes. Learn your body. Learn your edges. Learn uh, a scale from 1 to 10 on how turned on you are. If 10 is ejaculate and 0 is uh, turned off, like ask yourself where you are. Learn how to play with the variations and the gradations of arousal. Yeah. Touch your whole body, involve your whole body, not just your genitals, right? Mm -hmm. What this does is this creates a different relationship, literally on a cellular level, to your body and your body's experience of pleasure. And what Mm. you need to be able to do in order to be great lover for women is you need to be able to read her body. And you cannot expect to read her body if you do not first figure out how to read your own. And once you know how to read your own body and what your own body responds to and likes and wants and needs, and you learn how to breathe, you know, the uh, people, the number one piece of advice I have ever given to any man ever, including my own lovers, is breathe. Just mm-hmm. breathe, breathe deeply. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we all get her, and we're, I'm, I do this too, we all get in trouble when we get up tight in our chest and we're not taking deep breaths. Well, guess what? The way that you learn how to control your orgasm, the way that you move slow enough to read a woman and her body and what she needs is just by breathing, which allows Mm -hmm. your body to be present. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not so much about getting it right in your mind as it is your body and being in your body and being present in your body, reading her body your body reading her body. Mm-hmm. I like to say, and if you anyone watched my Discovery Plus show, Good Sex, you heard me say this before, you are the result of an unbroken chain of hundreds of thousands of years of just homo sapiens sapiens successfully mm-hmm. mating. You mm-hmm. know, every single one of your ancestors until very recently with IVF and alternative ways of, um, of uh, uh, procreating has had sex. It's the mm-hmm. one thing that all of your ancestors have in common. Right. Like you actually know how to do it, but you got to get your <laughs> mind out of the way so that your body can remember how to do it. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, so know yourself and learn how to make love to yourself is what you're saying. And uh, what other items could they do to be the better? Lo- once they know their self, once they know what they love, and what they ca- they're capable of doing, they have the confidence. Uh, what would be the next thing for them to do? To be a great lover for their spouse or yeah, a girlfriend. Get feedback. Ask feedback. for fe- be be able to receive feedback because little thing about women's bodies, even just over the course of a month, how we need to be made love to changes dramatically. The difference between the first day of her cycle after her period has completed, or right mm-hmm. when it starts rather, versus mm-hmm. day fourteen around ovulation, versus day twenty one, twenty three, twenty four when she's about to menstruate, they're all completely different. Right. And then Mm -hmm. extrapolate that over a lifetime. She's, you know, she's uh, a a younger woman, maybe like in her early 20s versus someone in her mid 30s versus someone in her late 40s. All going to be very different. Right. Because Mm -hmm. we all our hormones are are changing day over day, week over week, month over month, year over year, decade over decade. So there is no one technique that I could give to you that's going to work on. Forget other women. The same woman two weeks in a row might not work. You know, <laughs> so instead of me and, and don't get me wrong, I teach plenty of techniques. I have courses full of te- techniques are great. But what you need before you get to the techniques is you need to be able to read how to use them. And you mm-hmm. need to be able to read her body in a moment to moment basis. And the best way for you to do that is to be open to receiving feedback and use that A-B touch that I showed you earlier. Do you prefer lick A or lick mm-hmm. B? Mm-hmm. Do you prefer stroke <laughs> A or stroke B and be able to receive that feedback? And then you'll get really good at reading her. Mm-hmm. And then you'll go, oh, the week after her period starts, she like really likes it rough. Mm-hmm. And the week before, she really likes it tender during that time. Mm-hmm. There's a great system that I teach. I'm uh, certified in. My mentor, Jaya, created it. It's called the Erotic Blueprints. Learn her blueprint. Similar to love languages in the sense that everyone likes to give and receive pleasure. Everyone's access to eroticism and orgasm and satisfaction are different. If she's a sensual blueprint and you're a kinky blueprint, well, guess what? You're going to have to learn to speak her language and right. teach her how to speak yours, too. Absolutely. Right? So then on top of that is techniques. Then once we know all of that, once we know where she's at, what kind of touch she prefers, what her erotic blueprint is, then I can load you up with techniques from here until next year. Mm-hmm. And you can try and test and play with all of them, receiving feedback and then capturing them and keeping them in your sort of like, you know, technical manual and in your, in your tool belt nice. uh, for the okay. future. I want to ask you, I want to get your perspective on this because uh, this is something I 
this came to light to me when I first started dating. Cause again, I was got married in 99 and I, I really hadn't dated since 1996, 97. So it had been years since I had dated. So here I am 2016 going out into the dating world. And I keep saying this in every podcast in every other uh, TikTok is that one thing that shocked me the most was how sexually aggressive women were at 2016. And I'm talking like sex on the first date and they initiated it. Uh, offering, you know, BJ's as we go to the movies, like, really? I, I just picked you up. Well, sure. I'll got me fine. Whatever. So it was just so odd to me uh, that I wasn't complaining, but I just, how sexually aggressive women were. Now, do you agree that within the past 20 years or so, there has been a change in that approach? Or is this something that, again, from my one standpoint, and it, it kind of varies, but has there been an aggressive, uh, I guess, approach with women since the past 20 years? Yeah, I think uh, there's, we could slice that up in a couple different ways. Okay. okay. One is that women are allowed to like sex now. You know, women had to pretend that they didn't like sex for a very long time because mm. we were we would be, you know, punished socially, right. slut shamed. Right. Uh -huh. If you were a woman that liked sex, you were dangerous. You know, uh, women are supposed to uh, keep their knees closed and mm -hmm. keep their eye on getting that ring. And then you're allowed to give sex to your husband, but you're never really supposed to like it. Right. It's right. kind of something that we were supposed to just do and put up with. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Women love sex. A lot of women enjoy, I mean, you know, on a biological level, like uh, uh, only one of our two uh, um, bodies is really capable of having back-to-back -back explosive orgasms for hours on end, right? right. I mean, uh, there's always exceptions. And of course, I'm talking about cisgendered, mostly heterosexual women when I say that. But, you know, women are finally allowed to enjoy sex and admit that they enjoy sex. And I think that's been a really important change inside of the last few decades. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, I think there's an increased amount of pressure on women to perform sexually just the same way that men are supposed to be performing sexually. So mm -hmm. there are plenty of women out there who like, it's actually not that they love sex. It's just that they feel like they're supposed to be sexually active, available and aggressive. And that's what's being expected of them in mm -hmm. today's dating. So they may be trying to remain competitive. Uh, they may be just acting out a script that they think they're supposed to be, right? Is yeah. that how he wants, you know? And, and again, we could look at the proliferation of porn and OnlyFans. And remember also that women today, especially women in their like uh, late 20s and younger, grew up also on a pretty steady diet of porn, right? Mm -hmm. um, men, there's like kind of a drop off between women of like 30 to 35, where most men 30 to 30, men, men 30 to 40 actually grew mm -hmm. up with a lot of porn. It wasn't mm -hmm. until about a decade later after internet porn's like real uh, proliferation that like women really got enrolled in watching it. And mm -hmm. I don't know why that is. I don't have numbers to back that up. It's just what right. I've experienced personally and, and how my clients have occurred for me. But younger women have, um, they've seen a lot of porn. They also grew up on porn and they're acting out the same script that men are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, it's just one thing that shocked me. And again, a lot of it, like you said, script. So I remember like the couple of times they would say things out loud. I'm like, are you really mean that? Or are you just kind of reading the script? Because like, just kind of felt artificial. But that's one thing that really blew me away and uh, a total change from the 90s. And again, uh, I, I remember seeing as a joke, I blame sex in the city at <laughs> the show. But uh, I wasn't complaining, but it was uh, a, a very different world, as I can say, from 96 to 2016. So it's amazing. And Toxic, I've got a couple more questions for you, but toxic culture, I noticed uh, as well, again, it's everybody was just really having sex with everybody nowadays, and a lot of it was unprotected, uh, and it, that shocks me. So with the toxic culture nowadays, uh, what advice would you give anybody out there maybe participating in it? Because what happened to me was odd because, for example, my toxic dating lifestyle, I would go and date a woman and we, I, the cycle is really three months, like the shelf life of that relationship, because somebody would implode it or say something and then, you know, we go our separate ways. And I remember that was just what I was used to for so many years. And now with my girlfriend now, which is the healthiest relationship I've ever had, we've been together three years. And I remember four months in, uh, I started getting like this performance anxiety. And I'm like, I, I wasn't interested no more. And she go, I, and I go, I'm a teller. I just have to tell, like, I don't know whether I'm bored, what's going on. And she says, I told, I tell her, look, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm attracted to you, but I'm just, I think I'm bored. I, I don't know what's going on. She goes, okay, well, what do you need? And I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> I didn't know what to say, but it, what it turned out was I was just so used to that life cycle 
of just different partners every three to four months and kind of that dopamine, I guess, thrill and that addiction. That's one thing that I found that living that toxic lifestyle affected my relationship as it is now. And we've solved that. We're better now. But is there any uh, pros or cons out there, I guess, cons of living that type of lifestyle, what to expect when you go into a serious relationship? I don't understand what you say by toxic lifestyle. You just mean like serial dating? I guess serial dating and just being promiscuous with numerous partners. And I guess I can rephrase that. I just like a very active lifestyle. Is there any detriment of that having type, having that type of lifestyle? How can that affect like maybe a serious relationship later on down the road? I mean, I think what you're, so two things that we didn't actually address earlier. Mm-hmm. Number one, the biggest issue for men inside of the uh, inside of relationships when they're no longer sexually active or available with their partners usually has to do with resentment. As oh. one of my coaches said to me, resentment is the biggest boner killer. So oh, any okay. resentment that a man is feeling and, you know, around that 90, 120 day mark, sometimes the resentment is just like, oh, am I actually going to commit to this woman? Mm-hmm. Are we actually committing? Am I limiting my options? Because when you say yes to one person, you're saying no to to potentially hundreds of others, right? Mm-hmm. And that can call up some stuff, especially for someone who's had a long-term relationship. Maybe they experienced hurt and betrayal. Like anything yeah. that that partner, they're going to start triggering you. And, you know, the first, the the, the erection is the biggest indication of, of, uh, of what's going on inside, right? Like mentally, mm-hmm. right? Because he right. won't show up because he, you know, dick don't lie. Like, you know, if there's anything there, if there's anything you got to clear, any insecurity, any fear that you have, any resentment that you have, mm-hmm. any uh, commitment issue that you have, it's going to be right there and you're not going to be able to like push past it. You know, unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of guys will get a Viagra p- pill and, and they attempt to push past it. But like right. really the best thing that you can do is address the underlying cause so that you don't have to rely on any external medication or mm-hmm. anything else in order to like you know, have the sex life that you want. Mm-hmm. So... Um, you know, I think, yes, for people who are serially dating, it's not the dating part that's problematic. You Mm -hmm. know, it's whatever they're not actually addressing internally, whatever internal work they're not doing that, that they're running from person to person trying to fill whatever hole it is that you're hoping the next person will fill. That's going to be the thing that implodes your relationship. Mm -hmm. Not that you had a bunch of other relationships. I tend to think of short partnerships, even short-term partnerships. Do you leave them better than you found them? You know, do you Good leave point. that person better than you found them? And do you make sure that you exit that relationship better than you were when you entered it? And mm-hmm. as long as you're doing that, then I don't think there's any harm in serial dating. Yeah. And, and again, I apologize because that was a, probably the most horribly worded question I've ever asked anybody. <laughs> so thank you for answering the question that I just gave you. So I guess what I was trying to get to is this. There's been a lot of talk and sometimes I go on, I'm on TikTok, right? So sometimes I see a bunch of lives and I just want to hear what young people are saying. And there is like a a soundbite that a lot of young men are repeating saying that women, if they have five to 10 partners, it reduces the chance of them connecting to their life made spiritually. Oh, right. And I'm like, and I'm like, that's gotta be some bullshit. So that's one question. I mean, I just don't see that. I don't understand. I don't know what science are getting this from, but is there any truth to that? Yeah, there is this, I keep seeing this (laughs) quote from this like toxic uh, misogynist female person on TikTok, which is like, "Uh, having new partners exhausts a woman's emotionally connective brain. Like each time she has a new partner, she pushes out so much oxytocin and dopamine and serotonin. And that, you know, essentially over time, she develops a tolerance for these neurotransmitters exactly. and she, she can't bond emotionally with someone else. Okay. I would, you know what? I'm, I'm a former scientist. I'm always open to reviewing a peer reviewed journal article. If someone can point me at one, I would love to see it, mm-hmm. but I will tell you, I have never, ever, <laughs> ever seen that in practice mm-hmm. in all of my coaching and forget that in my personal life. Mm-hmm. Like I was, I, I had a lot of sex partners in college. I was, there's a reason I became a sex coach. I loved having sex. Mm-hmm. You know, I, and I, when I met my now spouse, my husband, like we were very intentional about career. I was dating two other people when we met, you yeah. know, I was, mm-hmm. cause I was not putting my eggs in any one basket. Right. I knew all the people As I was dating. Should. I As was like should. not super serious about them. They were, you know, mm-hmm. it was just having a fun time during graduate school. Uh-huh. And when I met him, I was like, Oh, nope. 
this is it. Broke up all those other relationships. We mm-hmm. started talking about our future. You know, we were like, here's, here's, here's our long-term plan. Do you want marriage? Do you want children? Where do you want to live? How much money do you want to make? Like, you know, <laughs> we just switched into that gear. There was no, no, no part of my brain was like, uh, how do I bond with him? No. I was like, what kind of dress <laughs> am I going to wear at our wedding? You know, like I just exactly. like the slut shaming is so you got to dudes and, 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 and female people, like everyone listening to this and my non-binary fam, like slut shaming is taken a lot of different forms, Mm -hmm. but it it is, it is, it is, you'll know it when you see it because it will make you feel bad about women experiencing pleasure. And it will, and that it is always like women, if you have too much fun, you're ruining yourself for your future husband. It always has that flavor, but it just, it's, it's a, it's always a wolf in sheep's clothing. And it always sounds like, oh, we're just trying to look out for the women. Mm -hmm. No, forget that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because again, I'm an older guy. So I listen to these kids talking. I'm laughing. I'm like, where are you getting the pseudoscience from? I've never heard of that before. That's complete bullshit. And and I think you're right. There's a lot of uh, hatred um, that I see with the young men, maybe late, late teens, maybe all the way up until 30, that they're just bashing women who are enjoying their youth and coming up with all these doctrines like, uh, you know what, uh, women lose value after 30. They're just going to have fun and and uh, just do whoever they want. But at 30, then they'll come for the nice guy. So yeah. don't fall for those that don't fall for that gentleman. You don't want a woman with, you know, with like a used car, all this bullshit. Right. And I get them while they're young. And that's I have a daughter and I'm like, no, fuck that. No, I'm not going to no. let my daughter 19 get molded by some guy, you know, and right. it's exactly to what you want. So it's frustrating. Right. And I try to put so much good information out there. But I don't know where this comes from, this hatred. Maybe it's because they're having sex and, and the, these young men aren't. Maybe yeah, that's where it stands from. Yeah, I think that's a from. lot of it. You know, here's here, there's something painfully, it's, 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 it's like, <laughs> it's, I hate to admit that there's truth to this, but I think it's valuable if we look at it in this, through this lens, which is that like okay. young hot women have a, have a lot of power. Oh yeah. You know, I say that as I was, a, I am still fairly young and still pretty good looking, but I know looking back on it, I was in my, I had huge boobs. I have blonde hair. I have blue eyes, like very privileged in every single way. And you have a lot of power. You walk into a room, people cater to you. They open doors for you. They buy bottles for you. Like you have tons of power. Men get so resentful when they see these like young women exercising that power. (laughs) But dudes, the way that our society is set up is that you are going to inherit all the power later. You're going to grow gray hairs and a pot belly and we're going to find you sexy. (laughs) It's fucked up. You're going to make more money. You're going to have, you are, you just have to wait it out. But if you let all of that anger and that resentment at young women who, by the way, are just having their day. You know, a lot of them are going to become moms and, and gain 20 pounds and feel unsexy and feel tired all the time. Like Mm -hmm. let them have their freaking day and just know that yours is coming. But when you get so sour and so angry and so bitter and you blame women for your perceived lack of power, because guess what? You do lack power. You're a 17 to 27 year old guy. You don't have a good job. You barely have a car. Your Mm -hmm. beard isn't even full. You don't have a chest (laughs) hair yet. You like, you don't see the future. No woman sees that you're vital and she doesn't want to have sex with you. And I get that that is frustrating. Okay. Mm-hmm. Life is not fair and it sucks. I think you even have a TikTok that's like literally something like that. Yeah. Um, it is like- but, but don't let that get you down because your rewards come later in life. Women, they get power early in life. Men, they get power later in life. Unless you mm-hmm. get so angry and resentful and you hate women and you just bash and bash and bash, then guess what? That's a really great way to make sure that you never get any power either. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I've had some friends who felt that way and they want to change, but then they just have this hate. You know, I'm not a spiritual guy, but I feel that if you're around somebody who is just consumed with hate, you feel that. And especially a woman would feel that. And it's like, dude, you got to cure that, man. I mean, you can't be you can't have a successful dating life if you have all this hate and animosity because it comes off without even saying a word. Yes. And guess what? Then you have sex with these women and you literally put that hate directly into her pussy. Oh my God, that's right. Do you know yes. how fucked up that is? And that is, yes. that is, that describes <clears throat> so much of young men's entire dating strategy is I hate myself and I feel shame with my sex. Let me literally pound that into a woman's body as a way of cleaning myself of my oh own my internal God. shame and self-disgust. And you yes. don't think we get that? And you don't <laughs> wonder why women feel like trash after you've had sex with them? It's because you literally just, you have two options. You could enter her body with love, 
But you can enter it with hate. Yeah. yeah. And I some agree. women don't know the difference, unfortunately, because they're, they're not doing their self-pleasure practice. They're also self-loathing. They yeah. also hate themselves. That's not an excuse. Do better. Because mm-hmm. if you want to know the difference between like a Pete Davidson... Like oh, why, you know, like, why is it totally average looking guy who doesn't have a big, you know, collection of Bentleys or whatever? Like, why does he get to sleep with some of the hottest women in the world? I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with having a lighthearted personality. Maybe mm-hmm. it has something to do with making them laugh. Maybe he just doesn't fuck hate into them. Exactly. Right? So exactly. yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Hate begets more hate. Love yourself. Make love to yourself. Do the internal work of figuring out how to love yourself. You literally become a magnet for other people. Because Mm -hmm. guess what? We all inherently want to be around people who love themselves. I'm not talking about like egotistical self-obsession. I'm talking about like they take care of themselves. They take their body out on walks. They feed it grains. Mm -hmm. They get sunshine. They take good care of themselves. They smile. They, you know, they're not afraid of social interactions. We naturally want to be around those people. So become that person and, and then make love with love. Absolutely. Put love into her body. She will be back for more. Absolutely. A lot and, more. And, and you know what? I want to just uh, kind of close with this and get your feedback before we end. You mentioned Pete Davidson. Somebody had asked me, like, why is he scoring all these women? I'm like, well, maybe he's a humble guy who makes them laugh. Maybe that's what it is. And maybe he doesn't come. Maybe it ain't rocket science. Yeah, it's not. It's not that hard. And I remember <clears throat> one thing that I learned in the dating world. Like, again, I went out. I was very humble. I lost everything. I was rebuilding my life. And one compliment, and I want to get your take on this. One compliment that kept coming up every other woman, it was like, Rudy, you make me feel safe. Mm. And I was like, what? And I'm like, you make me feel safe. I'm like, w- like physically? She's, no, no, it's not that. It's just you're not mm-hmm. angry. You're not talking ill about mm-hmm. your ex-spouse. You wish her the best. You have positivity radiating about you, about your goals and what you want to do. You just make me feel safe. And that's what women loved. And I and wish they still more- wanted to sleep with you, right? We did. Yeah, yeah we did. Exactly. Because a lot all the time. of guys are afraid to hear that. They're like, well, if yeah. I make her feel safe, she won't want to fuck. No, it's like, no. actually quite the opposite. No, they would, it was, they were so safe. And again, I hadn't done this when I was married. They went, choke me. I'm like, what? I've never done that. And then they actually had to show me how to do it. I'm like, I got this. I'll learn. I'll learn. But that's how much fun we had. Not in the middle. Yeah. Don't put any pressure right in the middle of her throat. Just the sides. Just the sides. Yeah. And then I pull my hair. So it was very eye opening for me. Then I'm reading all these books about dating, how to be successful women. They all say, make a woman feel safe. I mean, you don't want to do it to her. It's manipulative, right? But I tell men, if you have a good persona, if you're just a guy who just is humble, doesn't take themselves too seriously, but you're ambitious and you can make a woman laugh, that'll work for you. You don't have to have six, uh, six foot tall abs and six figures. That's all bullshit. So what is your take on that? I agree a thousand percent. What I like (laughs) to say is, uh, and, and everything that you just said is specifically on the end there, because guys come to my YouTube videos every single mm-hmm. week and go, yeah, this would work if I'm six foot tall. Height has nothing to do with it. I'm it five has nothing nine. to do with uh, it. My husband's yeah. five nine. Yeah, I think he, pro- he probably wouldn't let me saying that. But it's so <laughs> absurd. You know, we, we actually if you look around, you'll see plenty of plenty of women with guys that are like not conventionally attractive, not pulling in big bucks, not high status jobs. Right. Ask yourself what it is that they're probably providing for her. Probably they're great lovers, you mm-hmm. know, probably they eat pussy. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. that yeah. I think goes without saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they make her feel safe. And what, and, and what I teach to my guys is safety first and then danger. And I don't mean danger like I might pop off and hit a wall. You know, I'm right. like somebody's getting punched in this club tonight, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, w- like in the sense of this is what the divine masculine provides for the divine feminine. Like mm-hmm. he, he provides a backdrop of safety, a foundation of safety. By the way, safety is the number one indication of whether or not she's going to have an orgasm. We cannot reach orgasm unless we have in our nervous system, we are in our parasympathetic nervous system. We need to be in the parasympathetic. And then when we orgasm, switch to the sympathetic and then back. So what that means is we're in the rest and digest nervous system. We yeah. go fight and flight and then we come back. If you're in fight or flight because you don't feel safe, you're, it's going to be near impossible to orgasm. And if you do, it's going to be like a sneeze from your genitals. It's not like a real deep <laughs> roaring, screaming, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. trembling orgasm. It's going to be like a chew, a came. <laughs> <laughs> so what I teach them is safety first and then danger. And danger, by the way, it could be novelty. It can be risk. Like it could be, Hey, like, let's go, you know, let's, let's sneak around this building and make out in the rain. You know, yeah. it just, it's not danger, danger in the sense of like, are we, you know, it's, are we, we're driving around in a neighborhood with our 
<laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I, let me defend you against somebody. It's it's more just like we're going to try anything. My husband is really, really good at this. His risk tolerance and danger to like, he, you know, he was a uh, 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 inline skater and, you know, he. he oh, yeah. He, he like is a clown. Like he loves to like jump up on things and I'm always like, ah, we're going to get hurt. You know, he wants to like dip <laughs> me over, or, you know, mm-hmm. dance around with me outside. Like those things that cause a, like a little bit of a feeling of danger, just like running across the street when the cars are coming, whatever, like, you know, mitigated risks that women don't take on their own. If or she and her girlfriends don't do that, we don't do that together for the most mm-hmm. part. We like to stay safe with our girlfriends. Right. But you maybe twirl her out on the floor and show, show her off in front of a bunch of people when no one's on the dance floor. That's a little bit psychologically dangerous, right? Oh. So background of safety, she knows that you've got her. You're not going to just ditch her out there on the stage in front of all those people, right? Yeah. And then the danger of like, oh my gosh, we're going to dance while everybody's watching. You're crazy. So. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, you know what, Caitlin? This is probably the most insightful educational podcast I've ever had. And uh, this is something I'm probably going to play over and over again myself and just make notes. So this is amazing. But where can people find you? You can find me on YouTube. You can search for Better Sex Coach or Caitlin V. C A I T L I N V as in victorious. Um, I post a video every single week helping you to get better in bed, have better intimate relationships, um, and and just have generally more satisfaction in your relationships with women. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can, if you are a female person and you'd like some more of my advice, you can find me on Instagram at Caitlin Victorious X. Thank you so much. Caitlin, again, this was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, that does it for the show, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Please send me feedback on what your thoughts were with some of the ideas and topics that we talked about. I want this to be a two-way dialogue. So please send your ideas and comments your way on whatever platform you're listening on. And again, I want to thank Caitlin V for being on the show. And don't forget about supporting my platforms as well, everybody. My YouTube channel is almost at 1,000 followers. Help me get to 100,000 in the next couple of years, please. I'm putting content on there all the time, clips from the show and great advice that's going to help you in your life. And again, thank you so much for listening to the program. It really means a world to me. Wish everybody the best and thank you for making the podcast such a success in the short amount of time that has been out. It means a world to me. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.